Esther Lucille Westenbarger was a 51-year-old from Kokomo, Indiana. On the night of November 12, 2009, video caught Esther's vehicle leaving a local tavern, headed toward her home. She never arrived. On June 17, 2020, her car with Esther inside was pulled from a retention pond located within a half mile of her house. Today, we remember Esther. I'm Ed Dunsell, and this is Unfound. question for all of you. How many of you don't live anywhere near where you grew up? Hold your hands up so I can see you. Yes, there's quite a few of you, as I expected. I'm the same. I haven't lived in Pennsylvania where I grew up in almost two decades. In fact, my parents don't even live in my hometown of Leechburg anymore. They live in a place called Renfrew. I bring you this program from Madeira Beach, Florida. But I still find myself calling Pennsylvania home. Do you do the same? Do you call your hometown home even though you haven't lived there in 10 years or 20 years? Why do we do that? Are our childhood memories that strong? Are they that emotionally powerful? I guess so. In fact, in recent years, I've tried to condition myself to say I'm going back to Pennsylvania when I'm going to see my parents instead of I'm going quote-unquote home. But I still really have to think about it before I say it. It's very strange. In Esther Westenbarger's case, she was going home to Kokomo, Indiana, a place where she grew up, a place where much of her family, including her mother, still lived, a place where she wanted to start a diner. But something happened. She came home, then she disappeared. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Goodsight, charlieproject.org. Esther Westenbarger was last seen leaving Miller's Tavern on Elm Street in Kokomo, Indiana at 1.30 a.m. on November 12, 2009. It is believed she was walking back to her Cadillac still parked at the first bar she visited that night, Hoosier Bar. She was never heard from again. And her car, a gold 2005 Cadillac CTS with a personalized Ohio license plate reading M-S-E-S-T-E-R, also disappeared. Esther lived most of her life in Fostoria, Ohio, and was employed with Findlay Industries for almost 20 years. She moved to Kokomo not long after receiving a buyout from her employer. She did this in order to live closer to her mother and siblings. Weston Barger left all of her belongings behind at home, and her loved ones don't believe she left on her own. They fear foul play was involved in her disappearance. Her case remains unsolved. The interview for this episode is with her daughter, Matilda Weston Barger. Unfound News First and foremost, did you get your newsletter? It came out last Saturday. Yes, I managed to get it done on my birthday. I hope you received it. If you didn't, please contact me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Next, I'm going to be starting a new project. Since there has been a very positive reaction to the map videos I've been doing to go along with recent podcasts, I'm going to be going back through all disappearances that are still unsolved that Unfound has covered, and do map videos for them. Granted, some of the cases don't lend themselves to map explanations, but many do. I will pick those ones out and record videos for them. They will be posted to Unfound's YouTube channel. Finally, and speaking of projects, we as a team are slowly getting closer to this new one that my assistant Cherie came up with a couple months ago. We now have a name for it, the Unfound Roundtable. 
That's all I can say for now. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, Deezer, Facebook, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on our podcast channel for the Unfound live show. All of you can talk with me, and I can answer your questions. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. You can also contribute to PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the daughter of Esther Westenbarger, Matilda Westenbarger. Matilda, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Please let the listeners know a little bit about your mother, Esther. What are some memories that come to your mind as you think about her now? Um, well, my mom was a very hardworking mom. She lived for us kids. There's me and my brother. And everything she did through our lives was for us. She was, I don't know, she was very creative. She used to dress us up at Halloween time, and we always won the parades because she was, very devoted mom, and she's yeah. friendly, and she laughed a lot. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did, did she make those costumes herself? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one year, my brother was Bart Simpson, and I was a, a Smurf, and we won first place in the parade, and then another year, uh, he was again Bart Simpson, because that's what he wanted, and I was Lisa Simpson off the Simpsons, and we won again, so I, we won first place. She was just a great mom. There's no other word around it. She was everything. She worked two jobs so that my brother could be in sports and so I could be in softball and baton. And she was just a great mom. And she came uh, from a large family. And we're going to get into a little bit deeper about your family a little later. But she came, She had many brothers and sisters, right? Uh, brothers. She has three, I believe. Off, I, I'm trying mm -hmm. to count here. There's. Four, sorry, she had four brothers, and she mm -hmm. has five sisters. And she ended up working in Ohio uh, for Chrysler. How long uh, did she have that job? And that's going to play a factor into eventually into, you know, I think what happened here. But uh, for how long did she work there approximately? And did she, you know, did she like it? And what do you remember um, about it? Well, she worked... She worked 17 years at a local factory called Finley Industries that was in Ohio. Um, and then Chrysler was doing a mad hiring spree and she tried for a couple years, I don't know how long exactly, to get into Chrysler and then she finally did. And I want to say she got into it early 2000, either at the end of 99 or beginning of 2000. She um, was accepted, she was hired, and she worked there until... January of '09, and she got a bought. She got bought, bought out. So they like, I guess you could say, and like paid her, and I guess other employees to retire or take a severance package or something. Yeah, it was. She was going to get another layoff, and her unemployment had ran out, so she would have had to just take the layoff for six months to a year with no unemployment because it had ran out, and. She, or she could took the buyout, and she chose the buyout. I don't know the specifics to the buyout, though, but I know she. the buyout was in January of 2009, February of 2009, somewhere in that ballpark. Do you think, uh, of course, she ended up moving back to Indiana. Do you think that she was eventually going to get another job? Or I mean, she was quite young, still 51 years old. Do you think she was going to get another job eventually? She wanted to get a diner. She wanted to take her buyout money and buy, like, um, an old uh, restaurant that she could fix up. And she loved Neat. to cook. Sorry. She loved to cook. So she wanted to open her own restaurant. She looked at a couple of different places, but they were asking more than she was willing to put into it or whatnot. She didn't want to get financed for it. I remember that since she wasn't working. But, yeah, she was going to... She was going to continue working. She just, the buyout from Chrysler was just um, the inevitable. She, 
she either was going to lose her job automatically because Chrysler was going, like, they downsized. So she just took the buyout to help her until she could find something else. While this was going on, while she was working in Ohio, you uh, were living uh, in Georgia. How often did you talk to her? How often did you see her? Well, I didn't move to Georgia until September of 2009. Mm. So um, for the whole, I mean, the, the whole year of 2009 up until September, my mom and I were pretty close. I mean, she's always, like, with my daughter at the time, she always came around to see her grandbaby, and we would hang out, grill out, stuff like that. I mean, we always talked. And then I moved to Georgia, her birthday, her birthday, September 16th, I left Ohio and moved to Georgia. And we were on the phone at least once, maybe twice a week, up until her disappearance. She was going to come see us for my birthday, and then she was going to go to Florida to see my brother for his, because his birthday is December 8th. And then she was going to come back to Georgia and hang out with us during Christmas break for my daughter. But that never happened. And were you surprised? Did Had she mentioned moving back to Indiana while you still were in Ohio? Or were you surprised when she moved back there? What did you think about that? She had made frequent trips to Kokomo. Um, she lived in Toledo at the time, Toledo, Ohio. And she would go to Kokomo I would say at least once a month throughout her buyout because she didn't have anything else to do. So she would go and visit my grandma and I don't know what all she did down there. I never went with her, but she was there for like a week at a time during the month preceding, but she didn't eventually, she technically moved the second week of October is when she moved all of her stuff to Kokomo. But she, she went very frequently. She just wanted to be a part of her family again. Mm -hmm. And was she having uh, a good time going back there, I guess, seeing her mother and seeing family? Uh, and and what were you supportive of her going back to Indiana to live? No, I told her not to. I you told, told her, her multiple times. She didn't. She wasn't accepted by them like she should have been. Um, they looked at her as though like she was an outsider. She lived in Ohio through all of my brother and I's childhood. So she, they just, they didn't look at her the right way. They they didn't see her as a family member. They saw her as an outsider. And I didn't agree with it. I didn't, I didn't support her, but I, she is what she could do what she wanted. I just told her to be careful because the family's not, they're not the nicest people on the planet. All right, so when you say they saw her as an outsider, you don't mean the people of Kokomo, Indiana. You mean specifically her family. Yeah, the I wouldn't put my grandma in that category, but like her other brothers and sisters that reside in Kokomo didn't always like her presence in Kokomo. They felt like she was trying to show them up, be better than they are, something of that nature. And they weren't the most supportive to her being in the area. Do you think that your mother realized that or did she not care? She just said, hey, it's family. That's just the way it is. What do you think her feeling was on that? Um, I would have to be speculating, but mm -hmm. my mom was very naive. So I don't think she saw it the same as I did. I think she just saw it as like civil rivalry still, like, Brothers and sisters are going to be brothers and sisters. Um, she just thought that it would take time, I think, because she made that comment several times to me that it's just going to take time for them to be used to her back in the area. Uh, let's move on to maybe the days before she disappeared. You had told me that uh, in a prior conversation that she had given some money to your father. She and your father were divorced, but she had given him some money. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that um, and what happened there? It was just, once again, not long before she disappeared. She just, well, she just wanted him to hold it, um, kind of like a savings account in sense. Um, she just asked him if he would – she gave him the – 
she gave him some money and she gave him um, savings bonds that she had gotten for her grandkids, <clears throat> my daughter and my brother's daughter. And she just wanted him to hold on to them for safekeeping. She wasn't like, she didn't have a bank set up in Kokomo and she had her bank accounts here in Ohio, but she just wanted him to hold on to it for safekeeping. Um, to my knowledge, she asked for it the weekend of ha Halloween. She was back in Ohio and she went and she asked him for it and he said, yeah, and she ended up taking it the weekend of Halloween, but um, it was just so that he could hold on to it for her. She trusted him and like I said, they were friends. So. so even though they weren't together anymore, they still trusted each other to the point where she had no problem giving him some money and the expectation that at some point he would give it back to her. So they were right. still very close. Right. Okay, good. Good. Um, I don't know if we want to go into the exact amount, but it was a considerable amount of money. We'll just we'll just say it was at yeah. least into the four figures. Did had she ever done this kind of money thing with your father before in that she gave him money and then requested it back? Oh, I, I don't know. I can't okay. speculate. That okay. I don't know. Okay. Very well. Uh let's move on to some of the people that are going to be mentioned here in the upcoming part of this interview, because the, the listeners need to know who these people are. Who is your Uncle Bill? It's my mom. He's my mom's younger brother. Um, he I know, He's lived in Kokomo his whole life. Um, mm -hmm. He's, um, yeah. <laughs> He's a certain individual I don't particularly care for. Um, he's in and out of the law. He's always had some run in with the law, one or some form of another, and he's not always Mr. Good Guy. So, so he lived in Kokomo. Did he live with uh, your grandmother or did he live on his own? Was he married? Does he, and we'll get into that in a second. We know he has children, but is he married? What is his uh, familiar uh, status? Honestly, at the time of my mom's disappearance, I believe he was single. I believe I'm not quite sure on that. And he, but he has, but he has had some run-ins with the law throughout his life. Yes. Okay. And who is Mike? We aren't going to get into exactly the role that each of these plays in, in this uh, case, but who is Mike? Uh, he was the maintenance man at the trailer park that my mom was resi residing at when she moved to Kokomo. Um, as far as I know, all he did was like the yard stuff and if they had plumbing issues and stuff. And he was introduced to your mother through Bill, is that is that right? To my knowledge, that's correct. Okay. Who is Christy? She is Bill's youngest daughter, so she would be my mom's niece. Okay. And she's the youngest of the four. He has four daughters, and she's the youngest. And finally, who is Merrill? Um, Merle is my mom's nephew, technically, but we all grew up calling him Uncle Merle because my grandparents, <clears throat> my grandparents raised him. His mom, my mom's sister, Mary, died when he was just a baby. And my grandparents adopted him and raised him as one of their own. So we all grew up calling him Uncle Merle. But technically, he would be a nephew to my mom. And you had told me he was living with your mother in her new trailer uh, at the time she disappeared. Is that correct? To my knowledge, that's correct. Let's move on to what happened that night, what we know, what the police know, what you know uh, these years later. Can you explain to the listeners the, the 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 timeline of events that what happened? Of course, mentioning those names that were just introduced. To my knowledge, um, it was a Wednesday night. It was Wednesday, November eleventh, Veterans Day. My mom was asked to go on a date with that Mike guy, and she called me down in Georgia and was telling me. And I asked her if it was a date, like going to dinner and a movie, or if it was like a date, like you're going to go to the bar. And she said she believed it was going to be like the bar kind of date. And I told her just to be careful because, you know, not really dates start at a bar. 
and um, from there, I can only, I honestly can only speculate from the hearsay and all the above, but she ended up going to one of the two bars. It's either the Hoosier Bar or the Miller's Tavern. I still to this day get them confused with Mike. And while she was at this bar, she had ran into my Uncle Merle was supposedly there, as well as my cousin Christy saw her. And from there, Mike ended up leaving or having my mom go with him and her, his ex-girlfriend or current girlfriend um, to the other bar. And that's really the end of it. I mean, as far as, like, she just she went to a bar and she never came home. So she goes from, I believe she went to the Hoosier bar first because that's where her, I think, that her Cadillac, who, which hasn't been recovered, was, was parked. They go there, but then they walk to this other bar together. And then Mike and, I mean, she was supposed to be on a date with him, but he's with this other woman. They leave, and so they kind of leave your mother to walk back herself, I guess, to the other bar. And somewhere in there, she disappeared. Correct. And and not just she disappeared, but she her Cadillac, very nice car uh, that was parked at the other bar, also disappeared. And um, so let's uh, move on to this. Um, what, when did you first find out that your mother was missing? I found out the Friday after. Um, so it would have been the 13th. I found out my dad called. He was in Ohio. <clears throat> he called me and said that he had gotten a phone call from Christy and that my mom hadn't been talked to or heard from since Wednesday. And they were trying to get a hold of her and that if she were to call me to let them know that she called or whatever. And my first, my first initial response was, she just went on another vacation kind of thing. Like maybe she went to Ohio, she got tired of them and something of that nature. But then when I tried to call, her phone went straight to voicemail. Wasn't like my mom to have her phone off. Even when she was awake, she'd have her, or sleeping, she'd have her phone on. Um, her voicemail box was full, so I couldn't leave a voicemail. So I started calling, like I called my grandma and my grandma was hysterical. She was not something I could talk to. So I tried to call Christy, my cousin, that had called my dad. And she, again, her herself was pretty hysterical. They were searching everywhere they could think of for my mom, like a, like a hotel parking lot. And maybe she got disorientated because she was intoxicated or something. And long story short, it would have been that Saturday when I hacked into my mom's voicemails and nothing I mean there was a couple that were kind of like I guess at the time suspicious but that was just for because of being informed that your mom's not been seen or heard of but um it just went from there I um called everybody I could I called that Mike guy but he never answered me um so I could never get it. I never actually got to speak to him. He would never return my call or answer me. And then a couple of weeks later, his phone was shut off or changed numbers or whatever. So the guy that uh, went with your mo- out with your mother that night, he was very hard uh, to get a hold of. And, and have you ever spoken to him since that day? I have not. I have never spoken to him at all. Ever? <clears throat> not okay. once. No, never. Okay. My brother had spoke to him. I think they had gotten into a, a small altercation at the trailer park uh, a week or so later. I'm not exactly sure the time frame, but he claims he had nothing to do with it. And he actually claims that they weren't even on a date, that my mom just offered to go with them, that she knew that Tiffany was going to be there, his current ex-girlfriend. I don't know what her label was. Um and it just seemed like it was all just botched. Like, I don't know. He wasn't very friendly with my brother, I can tell you that much. So, When you called your cousin Christy, Bill's daughter, 
Was that when you found out that Christy had seen your mother the night that she disappeared? Or had you known b before yeah. then? That was just when you found out? No, when I called her that Friday, when my dad called me, she I asked her what was going on. And she all she said was is that she hadn't seen my mom since Wednesday night at the bar. And I said, you were there? And she said, well, yeah, me and Brian at the time was her boyfriend, now is her husband. We're on a date. And they had ran across my mom, and she was having fun like she normally does. And then later on during the night, Christy had to leave. She had to go get her kids from the babysitter, and she went up to my mom and asked her if she was going to be okay. And my mom gave her the, yeah, I'll be fine, you go, girl, kind of thing. Like, go ahead and go on and do what you got to do. And Christy said she loved her. She said, I love you, Aunt Esther, and I'll see you tomorrow. And my mom said, yep see you later or something of that nature and she left but my Chris, cousin Christy said that because Merle was there she didn't really feel all that horrible about leaving her because Merle was supposedly going to take care of her he was going to watch her or something so which like, would make again, sense awesome. being which would make sense being that he's your cousin and she he lives with your mother uh, so you know that would make sense so just so the listeners understand it that night at the Hoosier bar and then Miller's Tavern later. At one point, it was your mother, this Mike guy, his girlfriend, Meryl, who was a family member who was living with your mother, her niece, Christy, her boyfriend at the time, her future husband. So all these people who know each other are under that roof, the roof of Hoosier bar at least, at one time, and still that night at some point, your mother disappears. Correct. And they were all there kind of, at least Christy was there coincidentally, maybe even Merle was there coincidentally. Correct. Just happened to be there. Okay, I just wanted to make sure yep. the listeners understand that. What did the police do? Um, from my understanding, Howard County, well, my mom lived in Kokomo, Indiana, but she lived out of the city district. So she was, her address placed her in the Howard County Sheriff's Office District. Um, from my understanding, my Uncle Bill and his, at the time, son-in-law, Jeff McKay, who was a detective, I believe, on the Kokomo Police Department, had gone into my mom's trailer prior to reporting her missing. Um, they were searching for something. Um, we still, I guess, to this day, haven't figured out what they were searching for. They claimed they were searching for paraphernalia so my mom wouldn't get in trouble. But I disagree with that theory. But either way, um, Howard County wasn't informed of my mom's disappearance until the 12th. At like It was like in the evening of November 12th that she had been missing. Um, and from my talking with the sheriff, the lead detective on my mom's case at the Howard County Sheriff's Office, by the time they got to the trailer, he said whatever whatever evidence there were to have been collected, it was pretty well tampered with. Um, too many people had been in and out of the trailer walking around. The doorknobs had been touched multiple times. There was just little stuff they couldn't. They ended up gathering her hair off her hairbrush and took her toothbrush for DNA stuff. But they handled it as though, in the very beginning, they handled it as though my mom just went back to Ohio, pretty much. Like, she just decided she was done with Kokomo and she wanted to go back home. But here in Ohio, we all called, like, the Toledo Police Department to see if they could go check her house for us because my brother and I, again, didn't live in the state. And there was no activity at my mom's house in Toledo. We called some of her friends from Chrysler to see if they had seen her. They had no idea. Like, the last they had saw her was Halloween weekend when she was here. Um, and it just took from there. I mean, in all honesty, I have to say, I believe it was handled. It was mishandled from day one, being she was an Ohio resident in Indiana. They didn't take it seriously. And the family didn't do what they should have done to begin with either. So okay. it was all mishandled from the beginning. And I'm sure the police, given that they found out that she had been at one bar and was walking back to the other, 
they probably canvassed the area, you know, looking, you know, in backyards or if there's any, you know, back alleys or did they do anything like that to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Um, the first search that took place was for my mom would have been maybe a week later, and it was done by the Q Center. Uh, Monica Kaysen and a bunch of other people came from North Carolina, and they, they're the ones that got my mom put on the endangered missing persons list because they, from the description of what had all happened, they said it sounded like foul play was involved. So they're the ones that more or less got it considered endangered. Like she wasn't just voluntarily missing. She was, there was something seriously wrong. But they, with my brother's help, because my brother flew from Florida the same Friday that I found out about my mom's missing, my brother flew back from Florida to Kokomo, and he orchestrated the search with their help. And that's the first thing that I, that's the first search I recall happening for her, and it would have been about a week later. And it was family members mostly. Um, as far as I know, a couple people from Chrysler showed up from Ohio. They went. I was unable to go. Um, I wish I could have been there, but I, I couldn't afford to go. And it was a day long. I think it was on a Saturday, and there was nothing to recover. They, nobody mm -hmm. found anything of nature, like of any. Okay. No trace of her. So. Uh, let's move on to, um, you know, some suspicious things and maybe some evidence that was collected. Uh, the Hoosier bar happened to have a camera outside of it. And somebody, I don't know if it was your family or you or whoever it was, maybe the police, got a hold of that videotape. What did that videotape show outside of Hoosier bar? Well, after... Our first conversation speaking about this, I wanted to get clarification. So I called and talked to the lead detective again, and they did not recover the video. They were able to look at the video inside the Hoosier bar, but there was no, it was digitally recorded from my understanding. There was no hard copy of it. And he told me on the phone that it was a very grainy video. It was, um, not the greatest quality, but what they could see was that it was motion censored operated. So it only started to record when something motioned it to op, like when they censored it was being motioned. Mm -hmm. He said they could see a shadowy figure that entered the car because my mom's car was pulled in nose first. So it caught something getting into the car. He could not speculate whether it was male or female. He, they put it in reverse, they backed it out, and they took all, like, they drove out of the parking lot, and to my knowledge, I was wrong when we first spoke. They actually headed back in towards Kokomo. He said that if she would have turned to the right, she would have been heading home. If she turned to the left, she would have been entering in the city limits of Kokomo, and she went to, and it went to the left. Okay, um, so the Cadillac the turned to the left. Yeah, the detective speculates that it was my mom driving the car because he said it wasn't being driven irate as though like if they were just trying to get it out of there in a hurry, it would have took off in a fast manner. It did not. It took off slow and in normal circumstances like most people would be leaving in their car. But he could not, he can't say per se that my mom was the one driving it. Could not but, make out. but for sure, there was only one person in the video that the video happened to catch. Maybe somebody else could have gone on the other, maybe the passenger side. But as far as the video shows, it didn't show, for example, and not to be morbid, but it didn't show like two people, like one person carrying another person over their shoulder or anything. Just somebody going into the Cadillac, getting in and pulling out like anybody would do. Correct. He said it just showed a shadowy figure getting inside of it in the driver's side, getting in, putting it on, like turning it on, backing it out, and driving away. Okay. And then I did ask for clarification. I thought they had the video, but it was deleted within a couple of days after the detective saw it. They hadn't gotten a subpoena in time or something of the nature to have Hoosier Bar give it to them. So there is no video evidence of my mom getting in her car. It's not even there anymore. It was only seen that one time, and 
the lead detective and his his boss was the two people that saw it, along with the owner of the Hoosier bar, apparently. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. Um, your mother's phone. Uh, what can you tell the listeners of, about her phone? Was it pinged? Was it tracked? It, it's never been found, just like her car hasn't been found. But um, did she make any calls that night uh, that we should know about or a last text? What can you tell the listeners about her phone? There was the last message sent, text message wise, was sent a little after 11, the night of the 11th. And it was to my uncle um, asking if he was coming. And then the last phone call was at two something in the morning, and it was to my grandma's house. Um, on her phone records, it was only a 30 second phone call. And apparently, it was there was no outcome of it. My grandma said there wasn't a voicemail or anything left. So there was no, there's no record of that. Like in the sense, she didn't leave a message or anything. She just called, and I think it was at like, it was in the two, like two thirty, like beer bar closing time, kind of time frame around two two thirty in the morning. How do you know that that was the last text? I, it, when you say your uncle, we should make clear, being that she has various brothers, this would be to your text to your Uncle Bill that we mentioned previously, right? Correct. And I know because I subpoenaed her court or her phone records. I paid her phone bill um, from the time she went missing until the middle of 2010. I was then awarded trusteeship through the state of Ohio because my mom had a state here in Ohio that had to be taken care of. And as soon as I got the trusteeship, I asked Verizon if I could have copies from then, like in the middle of 2010, all the way back until October of 2009, and they were able to send me copies of her phone records, and that was the last text message on her phone. She sent it, and there was no response. He didn't write her back, and then the last phone call was on the, the 12th, November 12th, at two in the, I can't remember the, I want to say it was like 2.38 in the morning, she had called my grandma's phone number. And on the record, it shows it was only a 30 second phone call. And And it was just static. And then there was, yeah, and there was no, nothing after that. And then I had her phone disconnected painfully. I had her phone disconnected shortly after I got her phone records because I didn't, feel that there was any reason in paying for the phone bill when there was nothing going to be coming out of it. It had never turned back on, so it either died or whoever had it never turned it on because it never pinged any towers after that. So for six months, it was dead silence. Do you know the the cell phone tower that her last phone call, that 30-second phone call where it was just static, do you know the tower that it pinged off of? I do not. I don't know, but it was in the vicinity of the. It was in the the main one in downtown Kokomo, so it would have been within one of those two bars that she was at that she called. I don't know the tower though. No. All right. So in Kokomo, you're just saying that there is just one major cell phone tower. As far as I know, that's uh, what I had to. I mean, the detectives are the ones mm, that had to help me with mm, that part. I don't yeah. know that kind of technology, mm. but they said that it would have bounced off the one in downtown Kokomo. That okay. she would have had to have been at one of the two bars when she made the call. And what time? Maybe I, I don't know if we've ever talked about this the first time, but when the Cadillac left, do you know what time that it left the Hoosier bar? Do you remember that? Did the police ever tell you that? Uh not to my recollection, I don't know what time they were at last. I, I don't I don't have a clue. Being that you said that uh, the last text went, went to Bill, and being that his daughter was at one of those bars that night, uh, does anybody know if he actually ever did show up at either of those bars? Did anybody see him that night? Not to my recollection. Nobody's placed him there. Nobody. Okay. No, nobody's placed him there. His daughter didn't see him there, so I don't, I mean, and my Uncle Merle has never talked to me since this has all happened, so nobody that I can talk to has ever placed him there, no. Okay, and we should remind the listeners that this is the same bill that 
after it was discovered that your mother disappeared, he went with his son-in-law, who was a detective. They went over to her trailer and ransacked it for some reason, looking for something. Correct. There was something that your cousin Christy said uh, about that, that Mrs. Bill's daughter afterwards regarding that night. Uh, about this statement, you ruined it. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that? Just, she mentioned on the phone with me that, and this was months after, um, this was not currently right at the same time that me and her talked on that Saturday, but this mm-hmm. was months after me and her had spoken. She mentioned that her dad saw her a couple of days later and just all he could tell her was is that you ruined it. And at first her opinion was that she, because she left my mom, that she felt responsible for leaving my mom. But then it was more like he, he made her life a living hell. Truly to this day, it's still a mystery why. And so that, what he meant by that, that ruined its statement. Okay. I apologize for interrupting there. The you ruined its statement is still a mystery eight years later. Correct. But she didn't see her dad that night, even though it seems like your mother with that text expected was expecting Bill to show up there. Has has Bill ever said whether he showed up at that bar that night or not? Uh, he actually denies being a part of it at all. So no, he's never admitted it. Okay, so he says he – does he acknowledge even getting the text? Do you know? Um, to my knowledge, he denies that that was his phone number. He, and in truth be told, he had his number changed because it was at the time, it was not his phone number. When I tried to call it, it said that this number has been disconnected or changed or whatnot, but you can tell that it was his number because there was other phone records to show that she had called him before this night in the past and he had called her before this night in the past so but he denies that it was his number he didn't he Uh completely denied it your your uncle bill uh seems like a a a fairly shady character uh being you know some of the you know and you've kind of insinuated that or inferred that and and i agree with that um He and your mother didn't always get along, did they? No. No, they did not. They had their ups and downs more frequently than not. They had, they disagreed. He was probably the number one person in Kokomo that didn't want her in Kokomo. Like in the family sense, he was top dog. If my mom came back, he felt that she would overpower him or dominate his role that he carried with the family and he did not want her anywhere near Kokomo. The money that she got back from your dad, she had put into her car. Is yeah. that right? The day that she got it from yeah. the day she got it from my dad, she put it in the trunk of her Cadillac. But okay. that's the last that any of us know of it. So yes. It was never found in her trailer, somebody else didn't come forward and say, hey, she gave the money to me. There's no records of her opening up a new bank account in Kokomo, nothing like that. Not to my knowledge. And so it's very possible that the night that she disappeared and her car disappeared, that the money still could have been in the car because you told me she put the money in a, in a kind of a conspicuous place. It's poss- Yeah, it's very possible that it was inside of her car the night she went missing. Yeah. It, was spe- it was speculated by hearsay people from the bar that my mom was out saying that shops were on her that night because she had money in her Cadillac. Um, there was a couple of different, I guess, people that the sheriff's office had talked to that were at the bar that night that my mom was making these statements. Um, as far as I know, I don't believe she would have ever made these kind of statements. Mm. But again, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure if she was or wasn't. Okay. And your um, your cousin slash Uncle Merle, he was a guy that 
uh, you used to talk to at least once in a while. And he, if the listeners remember, he was actually at the bar that night. He saw your mother along with all these other people who saw her. And you kind of had a relationship with him over the years. Uh, since your mother disappeared, how, how many times have you talked to him? None. Zero. Why do you think that is? Any suspicions or uh, is, she, is it awkward for him? Or what, what, what's your insight into that being well, that you've known him over a period of years? He He's made the comment to my grandma that it would be too hard to look at me. I look just like my mom and it would be too hard to see me, too painful. Um, he made that that comment maybe in 2011 or 2012. And that's really the last time I ever tried to get a hold of him. I mean, like I was in Kokomo and I tried to see him while I was there. And that was the last time that any of the, he's made any of those comments. So, mm -hmm. um, so just so the listeners that the listeners are keeping count, um, we have a, a brother in bill who had a contentious relationship with your mother going back several years, maybe even back to when they were kids. I, I don't know. Um, for a while though, but at least as an adults. And there was the text that said that she was kind of expecting him to be, to come to the bar that night what, for whatever reason. It seems odd to me that she would expect him to be there if they aren't getting along, but you know, family's family. We have Mike who brought her to the bar that night, who won't talk to you after all these years. In fact, moved to a different state and changed his phone number, made it as difficult as possible for you to get a hold of him, and you've never talked to him. And then you have your Uncle Merle, who used to have a relationship with you, was there that night that she disappeared, and he doesn't want to talk to you again either. It's all very suspicious, Matilda. Correct. And I might add, too, that when I said that I don't think the case was handled appropriately, I lived in Georgia at the time my mom went missing. I was interrogated by Howard County Sheriff's Office when I stepped foot into Kokomo. Finally, in February of 2010 is when I went. I had to clean out her trailer. I was interrogated by them. My brother was interrogated. He lived in Florida at the time of my mom's disappearance. My father was interrogated. He lived in Ohio at the time of the disappearance. And besides the three of us being the family members, we were the only three family members that were ever spoken to by Howard County Sheriff's Office in an interrogation sense. We were the only ones. Not Bill. All the family members. Nope. Bill nope. was never interrogated. Mike nope, was never interrogated. Mike never was a never interrogated, and Merle was never nope. asked about it ever. They well, they were spoken to. But they were spoken to in their own circumstances. Like, I believe Bill was spoken to at his own residence or at my grandma's house. I'm not quite sure on that. I, I'd have to find out for sure. But I believe it was at either his house or my grandma's house. And it was only just a couple questions. Um, Merle, that I know of, has never been interrogated. He was never a lead. They never had any reason to believe he was a lead. Like, it was... They never had any reason to believe he was suspicious, let me put it that way. And then out of all the other family members that live in Kokomo, which is my mom's entire family, none of them were talked to or talked, like, none of them. None of them were interviewed. I don't believe Christy had ever been interviewed either. I'd have to find out for sure, but I don't believe she was ever interviewed by the cops. The three of us were, like, that's it, just me, my brother, and my dad. Those were the only three that were taken into Howard County. We had to go into the sheriff's office and sit down in the interrogation room, and we were talked to. But none of the other th none of the other family members were ever spoken to in the regards to where my mom went missing. Do you think? Do you view that as incompetence, or do you think something else is going on? I just think that it was. I mean, I understand that family members, like the immediate family members, which would be the three of us are the first suspects. I mean, I completely understand that, but we, none of us were in the state at the time. I just think that it's odd, it's odd that the family members that were in the area, in the city, had never been talked to in the case of, they, they were never, 
I don't know. I, I just think that it's weird that they were never investigated. I mean, none of them were investigated, not one of them. And I just think it's weird. They all played a big part in it. I know that the detective told me he talked to Mike and Tiffany. They were together at her apartment because she was moving back to Illinois at the time. And he said that he felt they had nothing to do with it. Off his gut instinct was they had nothing to do with it. And I just felt that was weird. Cause, but that's how I said she was never handled appropriately. Like they just went through the motions. They never, they never handled it appropriately. In my do you, do you think that it could be possibly because of Bill's son-in-law being a detective with the Kokomo police department? Do you think that has anything to do with it? Just to ask you very frankly. Um, possibility. But he didn't leave a very good track record, so it's possible, but I don't know. I'm not sure. He lost his job shortly after my mom went missing and became a car dealer salesperson, so I'm not really... The, the, detective, the, the detective lost his job. The, yeah, Jeff McKay, I'm, he, was a, he, he might not have been a detective on the Kokomo Police Department, but he was an officer with the Kokomo Police Department. I do know that for sure. He wore the suit. I just don't know what his status was. But he lost his job shortly after my mom went missing. He moved from Kokomo and got a job as a used car salesman. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It could be. I don't know. I'm just, it's all speculation. It's always been speculation. So who knows? Uh, one more thing about a piece of evidence. Of course, your mother is missing. Her car is missing. Her phone is missing. But her purse was turned in at some point. Somebody found it and turned it in. Anything that you can tell the listeners about that? Well, I asked Waymeyer when I spoke to him. Um, it was turned in, apparently, by my Uncle Merle. He claimed he found it in the trailer and took it so that nobody else would, find, would have found it. And he turned it in a week later to Howard County Sheriff's Office. He left it for the detective at the time. So, yeah, they have my mom's purse and evidence. Do you think that your mother would have gone out that night without a purse? No. No, there's no way. My mom had that thing attached to her hip. She never left the house without it. Never. So... But the purse, he says, was still at her trailer, even though she, the last time anybody saw her was out at those bars. And even if it was her in that car, in her car that turned out, that was seen in the video, she was going the wrong way, not headed to, toward her house. But somehow her purse ended up back at, her, at the trailer. Yeah, yes, it is, yeah. Whether, I mean, the speculation is she left it that night at the trailer. That's what detective believes and I told him that's not true my mom wouldn't have gone anywhere without it so I mean but the speculation is she left it that night at the trailer and they found he found it at the trailer he took it so that other people wouldn't have found it and then turned it into the Howard County Sheriff's Office was anything was everything in there was her credit cards or did anything to seem to be missing obviously her phone wasn't there but did it look like it had been no. sitting in a ditch? Did it look like it had been thrown out the window of a car? Or did it? To, to my not, I've never seen it, but to my knowledge, from what the detective asked me that my mom would carry, it seems as though everything was intact. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just uh, ask you this straight out. Is there any possibility that something else might have? I mean, we have intimated what you and I think happened, but is it possible that? Your mother might have had a couple in her. She got in her car. She pulled out. Yes, she went the wrong direction and maybe ran off the road into a, a lake somewhere. That happened here in Florida. That happens all the time. I don't know how often that can happen in Indiana, but uh, is that a possibility? Do, or do you I, think anything, it's something more sinister? Anything. I mean, technically, on if we're talking – Talking technical terms, everything's a possibility. She could have amnesia. She could be living in a whole other state, whole, living a whole other life, not know who she is. I mean, there's so many ifs, ands, or what's about it. It's not even funny. But I disagree. I don't believe that. 
I believe that something bad happened that night, maybe not so much intentional as more as an accidental something bad happened that night and people covered their tracks. That's what I believe. Uh, there's a million things that could have happened with her car. There, it, her car could have been sold to the top shop, like been just dis, like disassembled and sold for parts. Um, there is a lake outside of Kokomo. It's called Lake Mississippi. Her car could be there. We've never been able to search. Um, we've never had the clear to be able to search it. There's no reason for it. So anything we would find would be inadmissible. Um, it could be in a wood somewhere. It could be in somebody's garage. I mean, there's a million things that could have happened to her car. It's just never been found yet. So, is is car theft? To say, being that it was a Cadillac, a nice Cadillac, is car theft a, a popular crime in Kokomo, to your knowledge? It was at the time. I mean, it was the Fort Wayne was like the hub for Chicago, from my understanding. So people were snabbing cars and then selling them, like taking them up to Chicago and just assembling them or something. I don't know. The chop shops, whatever they do with chop mm-hmm. shops. But at my at my knowledge at the time, Fort Wayne was a hub. And Kokomo is just south of Fort Wayne, about an hour, give or take an hour, hour and a half south of Fort Wayne. So, I mean, it's possible. But I, I again, speculation. Nobody knows. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how, how tough has this been on you, Matilda, since this happened? Um, in the beginning, it was devastating. Um, there's like that weird, that really bad nightmare you want to wake up from and you never do. Um, as time's on, gone on, I've learned I have to accept it. I don't have to agree with it, but I have to accept it so I can live as normal of a life as I can. Um, but there's not a day that don't go by. I, I miss her. Mm-hmm. She's missed out on so much. Her, her and my daughter were extremely close. My daughter was four at the time this all happened. She has a very, very, um, imagination memories of my mom. Some are true, some are not, but it's what she has. And I let her keep them, but she's missed out on so much. My daughter will be a seventh grader. She's a straight A student. And I know my mom would have been delighted and very much so a part of our lives if she would have never went to that bar that night. Where can people find you online? I know you have a Facebook page, and and where can people get involved? How can they contact you? You should know that uh, recently some of the the cases that I've done that have listeners of mine had taken up the cases on their own and contacted the guests on the program to help out in some way. How can people find you online? How can my listeners find you if they want to contact you and help? Well, my mom has a Facebook page. It's find Esther L. Westenbarger. Um, That would be the first start. I check it periodically. I'm not on it every day, but I'll keep my eyes open for it. It links to my phone, so I get notifications. I and myself am also on Facebook. It's Matilda Mary. Matilda's with an H, so it's M-A-T-H-I-L-D-A, and then Mary, M-A-R-Y. Um... That would be the best two ways. Okay. And also your mother, I know, is listed on in the NamUs database, and she is on charlieproject.org. So when uh, this episode comes out, I'll be linking to all those uh, locations as well. Um, Matilda, anything else you'd like to say before we conclude this interview? Anything you want to say to anybody out there, the listeners or the person or persons who you think did this? It's an opportunity for you to say something. Um, to the listeners, I just want to say thank you. Um, any Anybody who will listen, we appreciate it. And to, the, to whoever did whatever or knows what happened, we just want to know where my mom is. That's really what we want. We want to know where she's at. So just give us, I don't know, call Howard County anonymously and just tell them where she's at. That's what we want. I just want to know where she's at. 
I don't even want to know why anymore. I just want to know where. Matilda, I appreciate you um, taking time out of your busy day. I know you're a very busy woman. I thank you for giving me uh, this time today on this episode of Unfound. I thank you, too. And that was my May 2017 interview with Matilda, daughter of Esther Westenbarger. I thank her for joining me and all of you over three years ago. About three weeks ago, I had a chance to speak with Matilda again, this time regarding the discovery of her mother and her mother's car. We covered many topics, some of which are confidential. However, I can relay to you, the listeners, how Esther and her Cadillac were found. This is what Matilda explained to me. The retention pond at 300 North and North Webster Street, from the time it was put there, had always grown a lot of algae. At the time of Esther's disappearance, there were only two houses near the pond, those being the two to the east and north of its location. However, as you can see now, there are many more houses around the pond. Due to it always being covered in algae, and I guess somewhat ugly, the HOA decided to put chlorine or some other chemical in it to clear the water up. Matilda's understanding is that this was the first time this had ever been done. However, she didn't say how long the chemicals were put in the water before Esther's car was seen. After the chemicals were added, the water began to clear up. Then, on June 17, 2020, some teenagers went out on a boat into this tiny retention pond to fish. It was a sunny day, and the sun bounced off of something shiny in the water. The kids thought they found some sort of treasure or something. They went and got their dad. They came back, and that's when the father determined the sun was bouncing off the roof of a car in the water. The cops were then called, and the Cadillac was pulled out. Esther was inside. She was identified scientifically. The investigation determined that the keys were in the ignition, the ignition was in the on position, and the car was in drive. Those facts were enough for authorities to determine Esther drove into the retention pond and that she was not the victim of foul play. Did she fall asleep at the wheel? We don't know. We'll never know. Did she have a heart attack while driving? We don't know. We'll never know. Was she drinking and driving? We don't know. We'll never know. Was she speeding and thought she was on a different road and couldn't stop at the sign at the T intersection? Once again, we don't know. We'll never know. Regarding the T intersection at 300 North and North Webster Street, and now looking at it with both satellite views and street view, why there wasn't a guardrail there to stop cars from blowing through that T intersection and flying into the water, I just don't know. Matilda says that the state or county is now looking into putting some type of barrier there. On the other hand, Given that Esther's accident happened 11 years ago and seemingly no other cars ever went into the pond, how do we know that? Because if they had, Esther's car would have been found when that other car wrecked. Given that only one car has gone into the retention pond in the last 11 years, maybe it's not so unusual that the pond wasn't blocked with a barrier. Yet, I think there will be changes made to that intersection before everything is said and done. Regarding my opinion back at the time Unfound covered this disappearance, I was quite sure that foul play was involved. In fact, if you have volume five of season one of the Unfound book series, I wrote my personal opinion on what happened. Frankly, I was way off. I was very suspicious of Esther's brother. He has an interesting history. And you heard in the interview how Matilda talked about him. Moreover, I had personally heard from people who were involved in the searches he arranged over the years. He would tell people to search in certain areas and not allow them to search in others. It now seems it was all a bunch of nothing. 
But Esther's disappearance and resolution shows how there is such a fine line between solved and unsolved. In this case, it was chlorine in a retention pond. Had somebody not decided that the water was just a bit too murky, it would have stayed murky, and Esther would still be missing. Another factor, I think, is the size of the pond. To look at it, it doesn't seem like it could hide a Cadillac. Yes, it's 150 feet long and 50 feet wide, but it doesn't look that deep. Certainly not deep enough that somebody wouldn't see a car in it from the shore. But that's what happened. In conclusion, I've had about a month and a half to think about Esther's disappearance since she and her car were found. I've convinced myself, and of course I'm biased, but if I had the expertise then that I have now, and had I had the assistance that I have now, I've convinced myself that we would have fixed in on that retention pond, and I surely would have told Matilda to make sure that pond was searched. Why? Because we do a lot more with maps than we did back then. That pond is the only one in like a five square mile area. And it was on Esther's way home. Yep, I'm going to be thinking about Esther's disappearance and recovery for a long time. We can't bring her back, but hopefully we can learn from her tragic accident. Esther, rest in peace. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Dunsell, and you've been listening to Unfound.